Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. My name is Bilal Abdul Karim, and this is our weekly question and answer session. Um, this week, uh, just like most weeks, we're going to be discussing whichever issues that you feel are important to you. First of all, I'd like to let everybody know uh, uh, out there that this is your show and you can ask anything that you want. You have a comment, send, send it, it in. in. You, you have, have a question, question send, send it in. in. <clears throat> we're going to be more than happy to entertain, to entertain all of that. that. Now, uh, this, this week... week uh, of, of course, course we're, we're going, going to be discussing, discussing the events which are taking place here in Syria, and we're going to be discussing events which are taking uh, place in other areas. Uh, in addition to that, we would like to uh, begin this program discussing something which is a little bit personal for me, which is my case that I have uh, that I levied against the United States government for a drone attack which took place on my car in 2016, among other attacks. That was the last and fiercest one, um, but it's the one that you know I, I remember more than, than the others, although I remember them all. But the point of the matter here is, is this, um, I raised a case against them for placing me on, uh, on what is widely known as a kill list. Um, why I'm on that, I don't know, and that's what this whole court case was all about. Uh, I wanted them to admit publicly why I am on that list but they declined to do that because that would mean that they would have to present the evidence that they used to actually include people in on that list, myself included. However, uh, that didn't happen because the, uh, the judge uh, deemed that the United States government's uh, petition of state secrets therefore they don't have to answer any questions was sufficient enough to trump if you want to call it that <clears throat> my constitutional rights as an american citizen um now first of all i want to say that i had a bit of an audience in court at least um there was an opportunity for people to listen to a part of the case and i say a very small minute part of the case just to see if it goes further which it didn't we never got into the fact that what evidence did they use so that was not really the case but why is it significant because here's one thing um if they want to try again after this broadcast or next week or the next time that I grass them up for doing some wrongdoing like launching a drone strike with kids playing in, in front of the area or, which is what we did before, or w when they hit a masjid on a Thursday when the uh, Tablighi Jama'ah was having their meeting and they killed 63 worshipers. Oh, we also grassed them up for that too. So you're starting to get the picture why they don't like me. Um, and I are, I'm sure that there are other reasons, but the point of the matter here is, is that unfortunately, this is the way that things have gone. Um, we won't even get an opportunity to challenge that in court because rather than to be a man and just stand up and say, this is the evidence against you, that's the evidence against you, that's the evidence against you, uh, we won't get an opportunity to do that because they just cried state secrets and just like that, um, uh, uh, it, it's all over. So uh, here we are. Um, what we're going to do is, um, you know, I'd be curious to know what you guys think of that. Um, uh, was it disappointing for me? Yeah, it was disappointing. Um, what we're going to do is, and, um, uh, you know, I'd be curious well, to know just, what you guys think of um, It was disappointing for me because, uh, yeah, it was, it was a two and a half year case. And for it to end just by somebody saying, okay, state secrets, didn't you know? And you don't even get a chance to deal with the evidence that they would use, I thought was pretty cowardly. And I want to mention something else that I think is pretty cowardly also. Um, if you notice that much of this has been carried by what you would call alternative media, which are smaller media outlets. Interesting how the larger media corporations that I worked with and contributed to, I never worked for them, but I contributed to reports uh, uh, for their channels and, uh, and publications, and we're going all the way down from 60 Minutes Australia to the CNNs, to the BBCs, to the Sky Newses, to the Channel 4s, and all of, and, and other than them, um, Interestingly, they haven't 
found any value in reporting this. I wonder why. Um, that's quite strange by their silence. But once again, it shows how politicized the media actually is. And it will be up to them, maybe at some point, to explain why they didn't think that. It says, Salam, brother. Wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullahi wa um, may Allah have mercy on him. Um, but yes, I did meet Anwar al awlaki Actually, there was one thing that I remembered about Anwar al awlaki that he did, which was, which was actually, it was fun to watch, but it was a little bit annoying. I mean, I don't need to tell you about Anwar al awlaki as a teacher because I'm sure that the questioner has probably uh, 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 listened to his recordings and such like that, and that's probably why he's familiar with him. But I'll tell you something that, that he used to do all the time. I remember I sat at his house one day, um, and uh, we were just sitting around, and we were talking, and every, like, 10 seconds, he kept picking up his daughter and kept kissing her. And this went on, like, like he'd be talking, and he'd say, yeah, and this and this and that. Okay, yeah, and everything, we'd be talking, and we'd, okay, yes. And it was like, come on, man, you already kissed her, you know? And it was, a, it was actually a funny thing. Um, so, yeah, I did meet him, and, uh, and that's that. Okay, um, let's take a look and see what we have here next. Um, Muhammad Farid says, um, Bilal, we don't see news of Idlib or Al Jazeera anymore. How is the situation? Uh, is everything seem right there? Well, of course, things are not right. You know, when you're in a war zone, things are not going to be right. That's the first thing. The second thing is, is why isn't Al Jazeera covering it? Well, Al Jazeera, like other news uh, uh, um, uh, outlets, they have they have their own thing that they or their own criterion that they use in order to gauge which stories they'll cover and which stories they won't cover, which are more important to their viewer audience and which are not. Um, I can't say that um, Idlib is a new story because it's not, but at the same time, um, I can say that it's disappointing that you don't have more publications that are covering what's happening here in Idlib, but it is what it is, it happens, and that's what uh, the situation is. So therefore, it turns to, or I should say falls to, people and uh, organizations like um, On the Ground News, and other than them that are on the ground and are able to bring the news, sometimes people would think that the only news worth seeing is the news that's on a certain channel. Well, that's not really the case. The news, um, there could be lots of news, important news, but for one reason or another, it's not reported on the major networks, just like the court case that I just had. So um, you really have to keep that in mind. I remember when I was younger and I used to watch the news with my mother, and I would just feel like, well, if somebody was saying that there was a story that was happening, and I didn't see it on the six o'clock evening news, which was only about 22 minutes long, um, then I would just think that it was either fake or it just wasn't important. And that was, as a child, that was the mentality that I had. Um, but of course, being older, I could really um, understand that that's just not the way that it is. All right, next, let's take a look. We have Jawad who said, what do you think of Arab leaders who want to normalize relations with Bashar the madman? Well, I guess I would say this. Um, that isn't shocking, isn't surprising. It's very, very uh, expected from them. Um, most of the Arab leaders, if not all of them, are all um, a bunch of self-centered, um, selfish, opportunistic uh, individuals. They don't generally seem to mean good for anybody except themselves. And those who do seem to want to do something uh, marginally good for the people only do so so that they could stay in power. And it's not so much as a Muslim thing or an Islamic thing, no matter how they dress. <laughs> cough, cough. I am talking about Mohammed bin Salman and his father and those no good nicks out there in Abu Dhabi. Um, and other than them, uh, I am saying that uh, they have failed the Muslim Ummah, but the unfortunate thing is that the Muslim Ummah continues to allow these individuals to govern and to rule. Um, if you look at uh, what happened in uh, places like uh, uh, Libya, they got rid of Muammar Gaddafi, but what did they replace, it, replace him with? 
Um, they got rid of uh, Bin Ali in Tunis, but what did they replace him with? So it's not enough just to uh, have a leader to step down or to be pulled down, but you also have to replace it with something. And that's only the beginning. That's only the beginning of the fight. The fight can, um, uh, uh, can race. And then it'll become a per perpetual cycle, and then you'll have a country like Pakistan that has its coups um, every few years. Um, the leaders always get tossed into either prison or they run away um, so that uh, 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 they can avoid corruption and things of this nature, um, which is a really, really sad situation. There's some good Pakistani people out there. I just don't know why they keep, a, uh, keep break, allowing allowing these losers to represent them. Uh, next. Well, let me just qualify something. Am I saying that Imran Khan, who is the president of uh, the prime minister of Pakistan, is a loser? I'm not saying that he's a loser. I'm going to say that I'm grossly disappointed in him, but I'm not quite at the point of calling him a loser just yet. Um, and my disappointment in him is that you see that wherever he goes now, he's talking about Kashmir and Kashmir and Kashmir. Ah, Kashmir. But then when you look at his situation, when he was asked about the Uyghurs, in the uh, East Turkestan or Xinjiang province, he says, oh, uh, uh, Uyghurs? T tell me again what you're talking about. Ah, oh, yes, yes, yes. I don't know anything about that. How could you not know anything about that? That's a neighbor and the Muslims are, are, are right there. I'm in Syria and I know about it. Everybody knows about it. The planet knows about it. But somehow you don't know anything about it. But then he counters and he says, well, I don't really know anything about that. You know, I haven't had a vacation. I haven't had a break. And since I took this job, a lot of stuff going on. Got to worry about the people of Pakistan. <laughs> and incidentally, by the way, the Chinese are a really good friend to Pakistan. Yeah. Yeah. Now, I'm not at the point of calling him a loser just yet, but I ain't that far away either. Next. Um, okay. Um, Hamza Rasul says, brother, please uh, tell uh, why are the Mujahideen not raiding regime areas, especially Hayat Tahrir Sham? Why do they get relaxed whenever there's no offensive by Assad? I mean, why don't they attack them on every checkpoint? All right, uh, I can't answer that question. I cannot speak for Hayat Tahrir Sham. Unfortunately, I cannot answer this question and they would have to answer it. Um, and I can't do that. Sorry about that. Um, Muhammad Farid said, how is the situation of Ahmed Rahal? Ahmed Rahal is out of prison and he's back uh, uh, to work and he's doing what he does best, um, which is reporting from uh, uh, this conflict zone and he's really, really good at that. Uh, next, we have, um, well, the Haq says, what's your opinion on Imran Khan's speech in the UN? Well, I think I pretty much gave you my opinion about uh, um, Imran Khan. Uh, and all, you know, how, how you want people to care about Kashmir. I get that. Totally, I get that. But don't be hypocritical because people, um, what would, if I could say to Imran Khan, I'd say, okay, Imran Khan, do you think people should care about Kashmir? He's going to say, yes. I said, do you really think that people should make some effort to make change in Kashmir? She say, yes. And I say, okay, well, how about if when you get up there, and you start talking about Kashmir, and then after the speech is over, you ask a few people, how was the speech? And the people say, the speech? The speech was about what? And you say, oh, I was talking about Kashmir. And people say, well, where's that? All because they don't want to deal with the issue that's at hand. What would you say, Imran Khan? I think you'd be offended, uh, wouldn't you? And I think that there are mm, probably about a billion Muslims that are offended by what you said when you didn't want to deal with that issue when you did an interview with TRT and other than that. Now. <laughs> and Al Jazeera. Now, nah. next, uh, Gardner Earth guy says Rudy Giuliani got elected mayor by promising to remove the squeegee guys that were at every traffic light during uh, Dickens' term on election night. After it was clear Rudy won, black vans drove the city. All righty, let's. Uh, black vans drove the city. Okay, now, this little one right here, first of all, Gardner Earth Guy, please send me a message back. Where are you and where are you from? 
Um, I'm very surprised that you remember this. Um, uh, yeah, I'm very shocked. I, I, it doesn't seem like there's a question here. Um, for people who don't know, Rudy Giuliani is the former mayor of New York City. And um, uh, uh, he is now currently the uh, personal lawyer for Donald Trump, which has got to tell you a lot about the mayor of New York City. Wow. Rudy Giuliani, David Dinkins. Very, very interesting. Garden Earth guy, please hit me back and tell me where are you from? Okay, next item up for bids. We have here, um, we have, okay, Adam Fernandez says, Israel is hounding the Shia from the skies in Iraq, uh, Syria. They can't find any safe place to store their weapons and armor. LOL. Um, well, what you say is true. It is definitely um, that the Shia uh, are getting uh, uh, smacked around here by the Israeli uh, uh, Air Force, um, both in Iraq and in Syria. And it is true that you cannot find a safe place to store um, their, their weapons and their personnel and ammunition and things of this nature. To be honest with you, I really wouldn't add the LOL part to it because um, I just don't, I mean, I'm in a war zone. I've seen my fair share or more than my fair share of killing and death, and it's not fun. And so I can't muster up enough to laugh uh, uh, and all. It's all sad. Um, it's sad when, um, when killing happens on all of the sides. I understand that war has to happen and that you cannot actually just ask the people, please, please stop. No, don't kill those people. Um, I totally get that. But I also get the fact that there are some really, really uninformed and if you want to call it stupid people that are in some of these different armies. And they just think that they're just doing a good thing. Why is it a good thing? I don't know. Because my cousin was there and I went with him. Why do you think that you should be in Syria fighting and all? Because Hassan Nasrallah told us. Okay, well, uh, did he explain to you what this whole thing was about? I don't know. Well, what about all those images that you keep seeing on TV of bombed out schools and hospitals in the free territories? What's up with that? I don't know. And then, you know, um, so I think that people like that are really too stupid for me to laugh and giggle when they get killed. I just hope that they would just wake up and ask themselves some serious questions. And if there are any uh, um, out there that are watching this, I would say to you, do you really think that all of these killings and murders and weapons of mass destruction used on all of these institutions, you think that that's fake? Are you serious with that? Where do, who do you think is killing th these people? This, the rebel forces don't have weapons of mass destruction. They don't have any helicopters. They haven't got any planes. They don't have ballistic missiles. They don't have bunker busters. So when you're looking on TV and you're seeing these huge craters where there used to be a hospital or there used to be a school, who do you think is carrying this out exactly? I'm very, very curious. I would love if there are some Shia out there that support Mr. Esed. I don't mind if you would uh, send me a personal message. I'd love to hear from you because I'd like to, I'd like to figure this thing out. Hmm. I haven't been able to do that yet. Next. Okay. Um, uh, Adam uh, uh, Resource and all said. Um, what is the situation on the front lines? What about the corruption allegations on HTS leadership? First question, what is the situation on the front lines? Well, um, uh, uh, some, not all, some of the front lines are somewhat quiet these days. Um, there are no major attacks happening from either side, although uh, that's not new. That happens uh, sometimes uh, uh, here in Syria and in other uh, conflict zones, uh, but it never stays that way. So we'll just have to wait and see what's going to happen next. Uh, second question, what about the corruption allegations on Hayat Tahrir Sham leadership? Um, uh, I do not know about that. They have not come out with any statements in that regard. I cannot um, be a mouthpiece for Hayat Tahrir Sham. Um, it will be up to them to um, defend those allegations. And uh, some people, quite a few people, uh, are asking the exact same question, not necessarily accusing them, but are saying, well, what do you have to say in that regard? It's been approximately two weeks. 
uh, two and a half weeks, and we have not heard anything as of yet. So if they do say something, we will bring it to you. Um, uh, anything more than the uh, written statement that they gave um, at Abu Abid's um, initial arrest, and uh, that's all that I've seen so far. And yes, we here at OGN do continue to follow that up, and we will bring news to you, inshallah, when we get it. All right, next item up for bids is Adam Fernandez again. He says, the Islamic State is watching the Shia get roasted, toasted after they helped America. Okay, Google Alan Henning, which is an aid worker that they thought was a good idea for them to kill. Uh, to ransom, a guy that came from the UK, for those people who understand the importance of it, left his family during Christmas time so that he could bring um, food and clothing and comfort to Muslims, and he himself wasn't Muslim. And then when he shows up here, ISIS says, oh, wait a minute, we got a guy here, and he's not even Muslim. We can take him hostage and hold him hostage and dangle him in front of the British government. Well, when the British government decided that they didn't want to play ball, they killed him. How stupid was that? I can't imagine how stupid that would possibly be because that person came here to help Muslims. Oh, wait a minute. Maybe you guys are not about helping the Muslims and we're only about helping yourselves. And that's why you got smacked around as well. And I could go on for a long time, but I digress. Now, let's go to the next one. It says, um, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Um, what, uh, from Go Live Media, Assalamu alaikum. What is your view on Erdogan creating a safe zone to return refugees, and how realistic do you think it is? Um, I don't think it's realistic. I don't think Erdogan believes it. I just think that he is uh, in a situation where he's playing ball with America. Um, I don't think that it's going to happen, period. Yes. Next. Um, Abu Munib said, Assalamu alaikum, your brother from Phil Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. All right now, may Allah bless you and keep you safe. Amin, amin, amin. Yo, that's Philly in the house. <laughs> okay, next. Um, we have here, okay, we have um, Gadolinium who says, Greeting from Latakia City. Greeting to you as well. That's uh, uh, Latakia City is in the uh, areas under the control of the regime. So it's very good to hear from you. And uh, may Allah keep you safe. Amin. All right. Next item up for bids we have here. Um, Yusuf uh, Vauda, who says, Assalamu alaikum, brother. I hope you are well from your brother in South Africa. All right. It's good to hear from you. Wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu. I had a great time when I was in your country, and I hope that I can come back there soon. And if ever you know anybody coming from there to here, please send me some Roy Boss tea. Because South Africa, to my knowledge, is the only country in the world that sells Roy Boss tea. Now, um, Adam Fernandez says that uh, Imran Khan is an apostate dog, um, and the uh, Pakistani army are traitors. Well, we're going to leave that for Imran Khan to defend, um, and uh, we'll just move on here. Okay, uh, what do we have here? Um, um, Ahmed Khalil said, Brother Bilal, what is the state of the revolution, and are people still supporting it or are turning to Esed? Okay, uh, th there are two things that need to be brought up to answer this question. question uh, uh, answer number one, are people still supporting it? Absolutely. Nobody here, in spite of the problems that are happening here, think that it's a good idea to go back to the regime territories. Um, they understand the situation with the security services and what they lived under for decades. And nobody is clamoring for a, a, um, a, a resurgence of Bashar al-Assad and his leadership and rule. Um, it says, uh, but after having said that, I do think it's important that people understand and realize that that doesn't necessarily mean that they're happy with everything that's going on here in the free territories. But also at the same time, to be fair to all parties, is that when you are in a situation where you have to fight a war, a hot war, a very hot war, we've had some fighters come from Afghanistan and said that Afghanistan wasn't nearly as hot a fight as it is in Syria. 
Um, now, when you've got a situation like that, it's not easy to put forward the best services and and things of this nature. So um, I don't want to be unfair to anybody. I think that that is a major issue that um, that w- when you've got the forces that are governing in the free territories and at the same time they've got to split their resources, um, both financial and material uh, resources, uh, to um, uh, both fight a war and to uh, take care of the citizens and refugees is hard work. It's very hard work. It's not easy. So I think that should be borne in mind. Now, um, uh, let's see. Mo Mo 1995 says, are you going to ever talk about the revolution in Algeria, brother? Also, how important is it that I must apologize to you that I think that before I do talk about that, I need to re-review something to find out the newest information. My apologies in that regard. I've been busy with so many different conflicts around the world that I admit that my um, uh, uh, that my information uh regarding what's happening in Algeria is not where it needs to be. I apologize to you for that. Um, And yes, it is quite important, of course, as everybody knows, to liberate Al-Aqsa. Question is, who is going to do it and when? Next. All right. um, uh, Brother Bilal, what did you make of Hamza Yusuf's controversy surrounding his comments about the Syrian revolution? Um, I think that Hamza Yusuf, may Allah guide him, made a t- complete and total fool of himself um, with his comments. And I think that he made even more of a fool of himself when he gave out what people were calling a uh, an apology. Well, I didn't get the impression that it was an apology at all because he didn't apologize for anything except that he offended people. There's a big difference between I would come up to somebody and everything and I would see somebody in the street and I'd say, you know what? You're a total bum. You're a loser. And you know what? You are about the stupidest person I ever met. Then I go home and, you know, uh, uh, you know, people are sending me messages on Facebook and Twitter and WhatsApp and Telegram. And then they're saying, oh, that's not right. It's not fair. Not right. Not fair. And then I say, you know what? I'm going to get up here and I'm going to say I'm going to issue an apology. Here's my apology. My apology is that I'm sorry if I offended people. I didn't want to offend people because I love the people and the people love me and I don't want to offend anybody. But if I did offend some people, I'm really royally sorry. I really apologize for that. Okay, I didn't apologize for anything. I didn't say that it was wrong for me to call that man a bum, a loser, and and, and a stupid head. I didn't apologize for that. I apologize for the fact that I offended people. That's not one and the same thing. So I don't know what kind of apology he thought that was, but I didn't think that it was an apology, and I don't think that the other millions of Syrians here did either. Next. Um... Uh, is the political is is political crisis going on um, between the rebel groups, or have Idlib uh, become political game of Turkey and Iran? Well, first thing, is there a political crisis going on in Idlib between rebel groups? Uh, no, there isn't a political crisis. No, um, there have been in the past, but there isn't now. Um, or have Idlib has Idlib become a political game of Turkey and Iran? Well, Idlib definitely is a political football. I can definitely say that. Um, so yeah, uh, if I can answer that second question, uh, it has become a political football and it seems like the parties are, um, using it, it to the best of their, um, advantage. And I must admit, I'm not overly convinced that the Syrian people are the recipients of their interference. Uh, okay. Let's take a look and see what we have here. Um, Okay, we have a uh, pense Islamic said salam uh, salam alaikum from France. Wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. May Allah reward you with good things, Bilal. You are a model for us. May Allah reward you also for your kind words. I really appreciate that. And don't forget uh, uh, me and all the OGN staff in your duas. Okay, uh, let's see. Um, Godolinium said, uh, do you think there is still hope for free Syria uh, to win the war against Assad? Absolutely. Every day that this revolution continues is a day when rebel forces have an opportunity to get strong. Everybody knows that and that's why they would like to, the enemies would like to uh, finish it as soon as possible. 
Okay, we're going to take another two or th two or three questions. Um, okay, uh, Javed Sayed uh, Ahmed said, "Be aware of the big ties NATO has with groups like the Free Syrian Army and JTS." Um, uh, do you mean Jabhat Tahrir Sham? That group ceased to exist, and there a height Tahrir Sham. Is that what you're meaning? I'm not sure. Um, I thought of the possibility that behind some assassinations and bombings um, might n might be not Russia or the Turks, but NATO troops. Is it possible? I don't think that there are NATO troops. To uh, uh, to be honest with you, um, I do think that it um, it is. Uh, uh, there are definitely proxies on the ground from the countries that um, that are part of NATO. Yes, that part I do, but not necessarily troops acting on behalf of NATO, because NATO is just a coming together for, for somebody that's that's getting assassinated or about to get assassinated or gets wounded or something like that, and they say, "Hey, wait a minute, that wasn't NATO, it was America." Or that was this one or that one. And the person said, just said, I don't care. You know, or what are we doing, splitting hairs? Yeah, they wouldn't really care. But um, yeah, that, that, that's pretty much what I think about that. Now, okay. All right. Okay, let's take a look and see. Um, okay, let's see. We got two more questions here. We answered that one already. Um, okay, let's see what we have here. Mm, okay, um, all right. Um, Javed Saeed Ahmed said, okay, I meant Jabhat uh, Tahrir Surya, not Jabhat Tahrir Sham. Um, yeah, so yeah, uh, I do think that um, we kind of uh, touched on that topic and everything. Okay, thanks for, for that response there, Javed. And let's do one more. Um, okay. Uh, is it correct that the Syrian Arab army got weapons from the West through smuggling and the black market purchasing them from the companies that produce the weapons or corrupt militaries in other states? Um, I think that they didn't. That, that, that I'm sure that some weaponry came um, from alternative sources. But when you have the Russian government openly arming the, uh, the, the Syrian uh, uh, regime and the Iranians, that's all on the table. So they're getting plenty of arms without having to resort to alternative sources like the West. So yeah, I do think that um, they are getting a plenty of arms. Is it the West that's arming them as well? That I really cannot answer um, without sufficient proof. Would it surprise me? I really don't think that it would. Because if you notice, people want to talk about constitutions now. But dude, are you kidding me? Constitution? You still have a dictator that's killed upwards to a million people that's sitting right there. What are we going to do? We're going to vote? Are you serious? But at the end of the day, they are serious. And the joke is on me. It's on you, and it's on the Syrian people. That's it for this week. I am Bilal Abdul Kareem, and this has been our weekly question and answer session. Jazakum Allahu Khaira. We really appreciate you tuning in. Please join us next week as we will be back, inshallah ta'ala. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.